So let me start this kind of artist view of uh, the shock breakers because the before discussing on fasters because uh, just last week we had published the discovery of the shock breakout the made by our Argentine collaborators Marina Basten and Gaston Fratelli and uh, observe, observers Victor Busto he's amateur astronomers and happened to catch the supernova beef in a very short time after the explosion. So this, this is the time we estimated from the beginning of quark collapse and nothing here and one hour later it's appeared. So it's very, very early phase of the, the discovery and actually it, the, luminous, the brightness is increasing very sharply uh, in, the, in the next three uh, pictures and so on. So this is very, very uh, the good chance to almost once a million, some, something like that. And uh, <coughs> so just we reported in, in Nature. And uh, actually, the, we try to mod fit the model. And uh, the rising part is very nicely fit to the observed uh, the theoretical breakout. And uh, later, this uh, the early phase of the shock breakout constrain the parameters of, of the exploding star models. So it's so-called type 2b supernovae, which has a very sharp decline after the shock breakout, and then nickel heating, and so on. And uh, the parameter we derived is the uh, mass of the core of the roughly the 15, 18 solar mass range. And the hydrogen rich envelope is very small, 0.01 solar mass. And the uh, radius is sort of mod moderated and kind of yellow supergiant. And the nickel mass is sort of standard and exposed energy also very typical. But the overall picture is very nicely fit. And uh, <coughs> so this is the, well confirmed our theoretical expectation. But it's very nice to have shock break uh, at, at uh, this very early phase. Uh, and it's thanks to the amateur astronomers. And let me start uh, these fast stars and fast supernovae, so-called population three stars. And uh, so it's important to really identify what kind of stars are the fast stars and to, to, to give a chemical enrichment in the universe and, and brightness and so on. And it, there has been several approaches, the, the uh, numerical stimulation starting from cosmological conditions and uh, mass accretion onto the very tiny cores and feedback. And that determines the mass function in numerically. But it's also quite uncertain. And uh, for example, the, this is one of the recent examples of that such numerical simulation to derive the initial mass function of through new, uh, the including feedback from the forming stars and uh, using accretion phase. And there are several peaks and so on. But the latest model is uh, a bit different. But anyway, uh, it's important to really constrain another approach that is uh, chemical enrichment of the universe and uh, which we can observe from the very old metal poor stars. And that constrains what kind of st stars become a fast supernovae. And uh, it's important to make mass estimates of the supernova progenitors from those chemical abundances. So the, I will take this kind of nucleosynthesis ab approach. And uh, let me start from our the work back to 1997 when we organized the Santa Barbara workshop on supernovae for a half a year it's with Adam Burroughs and Friedel Thielmann. And uh, in, it's a very fun meeting as you can imagine like this and uh, we, we enjoyed very much for the workshop. And then <coughs> near the end we had a form homework. One is the uh, how to explain the abundance pattern of extremely metal poor stars, which we didn't know much before, which looks like this one. And uh, so we decided to write, write should, we should write, thought we, we should write organized paper by, with Adam and Friedel and uh, to explain the, some trends of manganese, chromium, nickel, iron, zinc, and so on. 
And this is notation for the which frequently comes here. And the second homework is uh, near the end of the workshop, there was a report on the discovery of supernova 1997EF, uh, again observed by Japanese amateur astronomer Sano, and this is November 1997. And the, the spectra was very, very peculiar at that time, and the, now it, it turned out it's a so called broad line type 1C, but at, at that time nobody really didn't know. So after reported, on the IAS circuit, the discovery of something, something transient, and IAS circuit did not say it's a supernova. And uh, after a few days, uh, finally they decided to name the type one supernova, uh, type, type, uh, the supernova name, 97EF. But anyway, the, uh, this is the beginning of uh, our story of the hypernova modeling. And these two looks like different things has some connection in the end, I will show you later. So the first homework is the abundance pattern of me very metal uh, stars is, is like this one. And uh, the, if we go to the smaller F over H, so-called smaller metallicity, the, there's some trend in the, something like here. Zinc over iron is going up toward the raw metallicity, and cobalt over iron is also up and the chromium down, magnesium down, and so on. And uh, there has been no good explanation uh, during the workshop. And uh, so, we, so we, uh, the, within the uh, organizers, we decided to try something. And uh, we, we played with a so-called mascot in that divides between the ejector and the neutron star. And because there is some gap near the mascot, the neutron excess. So there are some abundance patterns. Uh, the difference ca comes from the difference in the mascot and so on. So we, we try something. And we wrote a paper, but this, the trend is not, not really well successfully explained, but something there, uh, something related to the <coughs> uh, mascot and so on. But it still remains a problem. And then, Next homework is that very peculiar type 1 C supernova E97EF. And we have been very struggling with to explain the spectra and the power is joining, and, but still a lot of trouble happened. And finally, we coined after the, during the uh, interaction with the referees, and uh, there was a report. The, this GRB happened and the supernova 98 BW was observed. And this solved the problem. And the spectrum of 97 EF, this is a spectrum, and 98 BW is very similar, or so-called very broad line features. And uh, compared with the typical type 1A, 1B, 1Cs, uh, the features are quite broad. And which are the blend of many lines, not single lines. And that suggests quite a large amount of mass at high velocity. And uh, so we, anyway, the, we try to model this one. It's the, ah, uh, so initially there has been some concern if this supernova is really the associated with the GRB. And uh, I remember there was a work, the conference at the Space Telescope Institute, and there's a boat. If, and uh, the old GRB people, it's just this is a coincidence. And the old supernova paper, I remember, this is associated. And because 98BW is so peculiar compared with others. Anyway, the, that kind of concern disappeared after this discovery of this connect, connection between the GRB 030329 and this supernova 03BH. And, uh, the uh, cyclotron feature is very nicely changed into these broad line features. So the association is not clear. And this, uh, this GRB supernovae has a very high luminosity compared with other typical quark corp supernovae. And uh, this luminosity is, is gives the information about how much the reductive nickel, uh, the nickel 56 is produced, which decays into cobalt and cobalt is into the super iron mine here, and the, 
the exciting the expanding gas in, in this way. So <coughs> from the brightness, we can estimate the, how, how much amount of nickel is produced. That depends on the exposure energy and so on. And actually, the uh, large amount of nickel is, the production already, already suggests a very high energy of the explosion. And the model we have tried is uh, it, it type 1 C, so with no hydrogen, no he helium. So we remove those envelopes uh, by hand in this case. And they, they did they explode and assuming some mass cut and here. So <clears throat> the, the right curve uh, shape gives the, uh, the the time scale of the, the, the expansion and the diffusion, and that gives a relation like this one. And the spectra gives basically the expansion velocity near the photosphere. And uh, <coughs> we tried the models of the main sequence mass, the very relatively high side, because we expect it's uh, already that massive stars. And uh, CO core that we explored is something like this one. And it's clear that the, uh, the ordinary exposure energy cannot reproduce this closed line at feature at all. It's too narrow, it is theoretically. And also, the mass is very too small. So in order to fit, explain these broad line features, we really need a very high energy, 20 times higher than the typical one, and a quite large amount of material in the outer layers, and so on. And uh, this has been the finally models with the exposure energy 30, 40, 60 times 10 to the 51 L, and uh, the present some mass on, on in sequence uh, before removing hydrogen helium envelope is something like uh, around 40 solar mass plus minus 5 or something. And the amount of nickel is quite large compared with that the kind of typical nickel mass 0.07 solar mass. Uh, the, something like here. So we decided to call this hypernovae in terms of the exposure energy. And uh, this, I, I will show the, I discovered hypernovae by myself at in, in the uh, Prague. And uh, when I saw this one, I asked the taxi driver to stop. And, <laughs> and I found this one, the uh, hypernovae is really a huge supermarket. And around that time, we had also uh, the observation and the models for the, the uh, very, the, with very narrow features instead of the very broad one. And it's also very faint. The nickel mass estimated is the two times 10 to the minus three solar mass and so on. And this is the right curve and compared with 87A, it's very faint. And <coughs> the nickel mass is really like this one. And, uh, Narrow line suggest exposure energy four times ten to the fifty L. So combined with these ideas, the, we made some plot like this one, and the, this is shows the like kinetic energy of the explosion, the ten to the fifty one, fifty two, fifty three, and this is ten to fifty, as a function of this is a rough estimate of the main sequence mass, and. Uh, a nearby supernovae, something like 87A, 93J, 94I are well observed and well modeled, and they are very close to 10 to the 51 L, and the mass range is 15 and 20 solar mass. Now, the, we estimated the, uh, this hypernova is that does a high mass side, close to uh, 40, 45, 35, and so on. 97 EF is, was not associated with supernovae, but uh, the GRB, but the, it shows also quite high energy. And there are some in between some transition regions, so the, some intermediate exposure energy. And the nickel mass is also something similar trend. And uh, we also plotted the, uh, the, the <coughs> faint end of, of those two events. There. So we call this faint supernova branch. This is hypernova branch. <coughs> and the uh, power of the group has been updated this diagram, and the uh, recent one is something like this. It's mostly near the transition between here. And probably we might get, my guess is uh, this is a transition from neutron star formation and black hole formation. 
And I, around those days, so, uh, <coughs> so homework one was sort of solved, uh, not completely solved, but uh, understood the, in relation to the GRB and they exist some class of very high energy explosion. Then in the meantime, the observation of the metal poor stars is, are going on. And uh, this is the Tim Beard and Chris, no, but Chris Reeve coined the, the uh, name of the metal poor stars. And uh, starting from the uh, metal poor stars, very metal poor, extremely metal poor, ultra metal poor, hyper metal poor, and mega, mega metal poor, and so on. And uh, another hyper is here. <laughs> And they, for, for some reason, I don't know, the super is higher, higher part. And uh, the, with much better observation, the previous trends of zinc and cobalt and chromium and manganese have been confirmed by much better observations with smaller error bars. And uh, so <clears throat> that was a kind of puzzle at that time. So we had some ideas. Maybe now we, we know the, they exist a hypernova, very high energy explosion. And uh, we investigated the nucleosynthesis in these high energy explosions and found the, if the energy is, energy is very, explosion energy is quite high, the temperature of very high temperature region is quite also extended, and the entropy of, of those regions is quite low in terms of density and so on. And uh, that enhances uh, zinc and so on. And uh, especially the, uh, in the metal poor cases, the first, the very high nucleosynthesis produce a lot of germanium 64 that decays into zinc 64, which is different from the neutron capture process in the much uh, later phase. But the <coughs> In, in the population three supernovae, this kind of things happen. That enhances the zinc and so on. And uh, very, <clears throat> and magnesium and chromium are produced in this so-called incompletely combining region mostly. So if we increase the iron, so relative abundance is, gets smaller and so on. And so, so in this way, the high energy explosion has some particular the features. Uh, compared with normal ones, and uh, that more theoretical one is uh, nucleosynthesis, uh, the, uh, this, the abundance profile after nucleosynthesis in hypernovae and normal supernovae uh, looks like this one. And uh, there is a more extended region of compressive combining that produce more iron and so on, and uh, zinc and co cobalt are enhanced, but natrium is also enhanced in this the completely combining regions and so on. So that could be good to explain the strange abundance patterns. And uh, this is the uh, abundance pattern, uh, the, the, the metal poor stars. The, this is a very metal poor stars, but the, the less than minus, Fe over H between minus two and minus three. And uh, these are the typical abundance patterns. And, and for this, the normal explosion energy models can explain nicely, not so bad, between the lines and the <coughs> dots. Now, if you go to extreme millimeter of stars, minus, this is the around minus four, then the agreement between the normal explosion energy models and observed the, the abundance patterns are not so well especially this zinc and cobalt region, as you can see. So, and this is for the normal explosion energy. So we decided to increase the explosion energy by a factor of 10 here. And then the agreement around here is become quite good. <coughs> so the, uh, so this really suggests the, uh, these are, Abundance pattern for the metal poor, extremely metal poor stars, uh, is responsible by the very high uh, exposure energy with so called hypernovae. And then later, another ex extreme case has been reported. The, uh, now, FeO byte is minus 5.7, it's really small. 
But at the same time, they reported the carbon over iron is really plus four. So in total, the metallicity is not so small, but uh, this quite a large ratio of the carbon over iron was not known before. So this is something also could be special for this very hypermetal hyper poor star. And uh, this just illustrates uh, the the uh, solar relative to solar abundance. Solar abundance is something like this one, and uh, the metal poor stars is uh, the the iron is very very small, and <coughs> so on. And uh, but carbon could be enhanced. So probably that is good for to form uh, metal poor stars in star forming regions. The anyway the <coughs> This is more the exact uh, the abundance pattern of those hypermetal poor stars and uh, iron uh, relative to hydrogen. So uh, iron is very poor, and then calcium, ti titanium, and sodium, magnesium, aluminum is something here in between, and CNO is so, sort of high compared with the iron. So this this has not really been not, has not been really predicted in the Supernova model before. <coughs> so it's a challenge. So <coughs> what we tried is uh, probably this is a, uh, we, saw, we published a nature paper with, with those observations. And uh, so the idea is a so called mixing and forward. So this is the ordinary the abundance profile after the explosion. So Carbon oxygen layer is burned, uh, is burned and to form near magnesium and some silicon is formed and some iron is formed. And the helium layer it does not too much the processed by shock wave. And the idea is uh, <coughs> to get the, uh, to, to, to produce a very metal porous, extremely metal porous stars. We need only uh, 10 to the minus five or 10 to minus six solar mass of the iron, not much. And, but we need a lot, lot of significant amount of carbon. So the idea is just most of the material falls back to onto the black hole. So forming six solar mass of the black hole. But if everything is falls back in spherically, the no iron is coming out. So there is a mixing process before uh, the fallback occurs. So that's why we call mixing and fallback. And uh, so some small amount of iron peak elements and, and the intermediate mass element is mixed out into this outer layer and ejected. Then uh, that kind of mixing is, uh, first we saw this kind of, this kind of radiative instabilities and the radiative instabilities mix the nickel is out and uh, some materials fall back to, but the later, <coughs> The idea is probably more likely is a jet lag explosion like this one. And the iron peak elements, small amount of iron peak elements is ejected along the jet like this one. And a lot of material falls back onto black hole and through this way, through the equatorial plane. So <clears throat> if this is the case, the, uh, actually we, mo we really model these explosions and uh, it really mimic this, uh, no, the con very much consistent with the idea of the mixing and fallback. And uh, so with this kind of nucleosynthesis models, uh, we can explain. But uh, there is an important parameter in this uh, approach. That is the time scale of energy deposition in, in forming jets. And it's one second to 100 seconds and so on. So if the energy is deposited very in short time, showing very strong the uh, yeah, here the strong shock wave uh, the jet in short time scale. Lots of nickel is produced, not not much fallback occurs, and in that case we we expect the very bright hypernovae which is associated with GRB. And uh, but if time scale is quite long, deposition rate is small something like 10 seconds, 100 seconds. Then <clears throat> the lot of material fall back. Uh, just we, we saw it in the <coughs> hydrodynamic models. And that produced very small nickel and uh, 
uh, very, very dark hypernovae. But the outer layer is, can be ejected, so that enhances carbon ion, ion ratio. So uh, the, for the, even for the same high, high energy e explosions, the, as a function of the deposition rate time scale, the, we, we could reproduce very carbon, high carbon over ion ratio or normal one as a function of this one. And the nickel mass is also a given by this function. And uh, so we, we don't know the real physics, how the jet is, time scale of the jet formation. And uh, that probably we need to simulate the electromagnetic process. But anyway, the, with this parameter in the jet, the <coughs> scale of the energy depositions, we can uh, nicely reproduce the abundance pattern, very high carbon intermediate, the uh, neon, man magnesium, aluminum, and the silicon, and then very small iron, and so on. This kind of, both patterns can be explained even with very high energy explosion. The, if we just simply spherical explosions, we need, we should use a relatively low energy explosion to get fallback, but the, with that, the high energy explosion also undergoes some fall, important amount of fallback. <coughs> now the, we have many, now the many, many observations have been done and uh, we have to ex explain many models. But uh, <coughs> the recent most interesting one is the, uh, the case of no hydrogen, uh, no, he no iron is observed. This is only upper limit. If you by it, it's uh, less than minus point seven point five. I think now it will be slightly different now, but <coughs> the but again they detected some calcium and magnesium oxygen and silicon. And again it's a very carbon rich relative to the calcium and uh, iron is only upper limit. <coughs> so <coughs> this model also in principle explained by the mixing and fallback like this one. And, uh, <coughs> but there is another idea of the observer's group is the most of the iron, all almost, all, all, all iron is fallback. And uh, even including calcium in the exploit. And uh, they explain the observed calcium as a product of the hot Sheno cycle. And at, at very low metallicity, the metallicity like, like typically 10 to the minus 10, so times solar, the uh, CNO cycle is going on in the envelope. It's very hot uh, in the center, in the core, it's at very high temperature, above 10 to the 8 Kelvin. And in those hot CNO cycle, the some amount, very small amount of calcium is produced. And uh, that could be the case, that is the another explanation for this object. And uh, if that is the case, the, the progenitor of this six, the explosion and, uh, and uh, that produces this abundance pattern is really the stars with the metallicity less than 10 to the minus 10 or so. It's really a population three almost. <coughs> so, it's important to really get the quite accurate calcium over iron ratio in, in the next few years. And uh, so this shows uh, the, this is the, the, the idea of the hot chain cycle to explain calcium. And this is our, our explosive nuclear synthesis. And the plane stability ex model cannot explain this abundance at, at all. <coughs> so the so we have a connection. We connected the, between the first supernovae and uh, now the ex extremely metal poor stars with carbon enhanced. We call now SEMP is a carbon enhanced metal poor star. This is E is not the extremely but the enhanced. <laughs> Anyway, the idea was the, as I said, the, the, the supernova that is responsible to form these same stars, carbon-enhanced metal-poor stars, uh, the fallback fall supernovae. But 
the jet lag explosion. And that could produce the uh, very small ion, but zinc of ion can be enhanced by this energetic denucleosynthesis and cobalt and titanium and so on. And uh, another idea is, of course, weak explosions and uh, <coughs> the more, more like a spherical and radiator instability and the mixing then fallback occurs. So it's important to really the, to test the these ideas with abundance pattern. And we, we also investigated the how the kind of fallback supernovae could be observed. Because it's a faint supernovae, so it's not easy to really catch. And uh, <coughs> so we calculate the light curve starting from the metal pores, the progenitors. So it has a, it was a blue, blue, blue super, the blue super, uh, super giant. So the, the so-called plateau and the rings are very tiny compared with the normal metal rich supernovae. It's like, like this is a time scale of the, and the brightness. And this is a so-called plateau. It's very, very faint and short. And then the nickel amount, produce, produced nickel amount is also could be small, so the tail is very faint. And uh, because of the, the uh, progenitor is was a blue supergiant, it's, the observation show, could show the relatively blue colors compared to the normal one and so on. So <clears throat> maybe the, if there is a the very metal poor pocket in the nearby, universe, we, we could see these kind of features. Anyway, the, this fallback idea is, uh, could give some hint to explain the non supernova GRB, which was mentioned in the on the first day. And this GRB has, should have uh, supernova features in, in, because of the short distance, but didn't. So that constraint, the nickel amount, mass of the nickel is something like less than 10 minus 3 solar mass. And uh, this could be just the jet lag explosion with lots of fallback. And uh, so that is consistent with the idea of the metal poster origin. So our suggestion is uh, there's a connect, based on the homework in 1997. The, there is a connection between the uh, metal poor star abundance patterns and the GRB hypernova nucleosynthesis. And, <clears throat> and the GRB hypernova may be corresponding to the extreme, ordinary extreme metal poor stars. And then the, with increasing degree of the jet lag shape, the, uh, the, they could explain, we didn't, I didn't write here, but a so-called carbon enhanced metal poor stars can be also related to the GRB hypernovae. And uh, very high metal poor stars, ultra metal poor stars and hyper metal poor stars with large carbon over ion ratios could be due to the fallback supernovae and that could be consistent with non supernova GRBs. So there is some connection between these two things in very early universe. And uh, so our suggestion is that the, the origin of these metal poor stars are probably fallback supernovae and black hole forming supernovae, possibly. Then there's a, our question is uh, the, what is the relation to the so called superluminous supernovae? And uh, is there any connection to these metal poor stars? So this is quite, I will be brief for this supernovae. And uh, this, is, this is a summary a bit uh, old one. But, uh, <coughs> the, it's sort of very bright compared the, with normal supernovae. And, uh, <coughs> So time scale is quite long, and uh, the brightness is, uh, in the extreme case, is even reaches minus 24 in absolute magnitude, and uh, 
there is some controversy if this, this is a really supernovae or a so-called tidal disruption event. But uh, anyway, these are called supernovae. supernovae. And uh, the tendency is the host galaxy is low mass, the dwarf galaxies, and relatively low mass metallicity. So this suggests the origin is also could be relatively massive stars because of the, the uh, low metallicity means uh, low small masses, right? And that the very massive stars could survive in, through the end. And the radius actually is very small compared to the, the normal quarkers supernovae, 1, 2, 10 to 3, 10 to 4. And the model is uh, not quite really settled. The, what kind of progenitors uh, uh, the, is responsible or and what are the mechanisms of the explosion. And uh, again, there is a type 1 and type 2. The type 2 is supernovae super with hydrogen, and type 1 supernovae super super with uh, no hydrogen. And there's a lot of controversy about this case. And the energy source the, the has been suggested radioactive decays. And uh, very massive quark quark supernovae could produce a lot of nickel. And pure instability supernovae even produce uh, the <coughs> 30, 40 solar mass of the nickel. And magneta can power a lot for this one. And uh, black hole activation also continues to, to provide energy until very late phase. And if there is a circumstellar material, the interaction with the ejector, be, between ejector and the circumstellar material could, can provide power for that long time. So <clears throat> there has been a lot of discussion about this. And the ma so-called magnetar model is very popular because it, there is a good enough parameters to express, to fit the right cover trees. So this is one example that we did with uh, the Marina Boston. And, uh, we tried this controversial one again also, the very bright one, but the, with, with parameters, something like the B field and the <coughs> period of the initial period. And then this is a so-called the, <coughs> the long GRB, the but supernovous one. And again, these are the parameters. Even very high exposure are the magnetic field. <coughs> and the problem is, uh, for example, this one is, uh, the eye. I cut, skip some things and undergo some UV rebrightening and so on. So this is not very explained by any model yet. And uh, so, yeah, I, I want to just emphasize that there are pro probably only a single model may not be able to explain everything. And some combination of the energy source, something magnet plus circumstantial interaction, black hole accretion plus circumstantial interaction, and so on. And uh, this example is, suggests some importance of this interaction. And uh, because it has a very, very UV bright phase. And this UV bright phase is difficult to reproduce with magnetars and the pensibility supernovae, but also very explained by this. Uh, interaction around here. <coughs> and also there are some superluminous supernovae which show the, this uh, light, car, light car with several peaks, something like that. And uh, this kind of the, the double peak or triple peak uh, light curve might require the existence of circumstellar material for to interact. And uh, this is a uh, the double peak example, there are several uh, this kind of object. <coughs> and this is one example, our trial to explain this, the kind of several uh, multiple peak with interaction and so on. Not, not really successful yet, but just we are trying. And, uh, but the, the interaction requires a lot of circumstantial material around. And that is a problem for the interaction models. And the one idea is a so-called pulsation of instability produce, ejects lots of material around just before going to collapse. Because they undergo the nonlinear oscillation like this one and uh, the some instability, the, it makes the temperature become very high and uh, 
lot of oxygen burning produce energy to expand, and but that not enough to really disrupt the whole stars like a pencil supernova, but just coming back and so on. But during this oscillation, the outer layers can be ejected and so on. <coughs> so if this is the case, if we need some combination of circumstantial material plus central activity, central engine, then the progenitor could be this mass range, 8 to 100, 140 for the process of This is consistent with the raw metallicity requirement for the, progen the host galaxies. And uh, that suggests uh, the circumstantial material plus particle accretion or circumstantial plus radioactivity. But sometimes this is not enough. And uh, in some cases, only the circumstantial material with multiple shells could explain. And if we, the central range is a magnetar and uh, plus circumstantial material around, the magnetar should form from the stars around 100 solar mass stars. So it's, I, I don't know if this is the case. But <coughs> the, the idea of the combined the energy source might suggest this kind of the activity in, the, in these days. <coughs> okay. ah. So that's it. So we, we need to have a lot of peculiar ones, but uh, the, they are providing very important information about in the beginning of the universe. Thank you very much. <coughs> For the superluminous supernova you were talking about at the end, you're, you're arguing that there needs to be perhaps some circumstellar interaction, but there isn't any much evidence of this in the spectra of these sources. You don't see hydrogen lines, you don't see helium lines. How, how do you hide those kind of emission lines if there's such strong interaction going on? Yeah, that's still a problem, yes. <laughs> but uh, the mainly the position of instability can produce lots of carbon oxygen material also. So hydrogen helium is, has been lost much early, early phase, and right just before the explosion, probably carbon oxygen material just ejected. There is spectral evidence in at least one, I remember we wrote with uh, Janet Chen, when the spectra don't change shape, but the luminosity goes, stays flat, and it's inconsistent with the temperature you will derive. So there seems to be added radiation, which is from hydrogen poor gas, because again, you don't see any emission light, but what Ken says is absolutely right. The hydrogen will be further out, so it may be impacting on carbon oxygen rich material, but it has been seen. What's the largest mass black holes you can create? <laughs> <laughs> I think that we are now trying the pulsation of instability, how much mass is ejected. And uh, the near the 140 solar mass case, the even, uh, as I said, carbon oxygen material is ejected. So that looks like it limits the black hole mass some around 40. So that could be a good indication. And uh, above the instability region, above 300 solar mass, the probably everything is pulled back. So it's just proportional to this progenitor mass. So, so probably black hole mass is jump from 40 to 300 or something. There's a gap. That's a, predi that's a prediction. Mm -hmm. Are you interested in how the distribution looks, how fast it falls off before the core? That's uh, part of the argument we were having with today about uh -huh. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. We still have time for a few questions. Or one for me. Uh, when you talk about this uh, metal poor stuff, the chemical state for carbon or nitrogen, what are the uh, form or the configuration for this chemical state? Chemical? In, in the interstellar matter, you mean? Uh, I think that. If people like the idea that carbon is responsible to form dust, and uh, that is a very cool, good agent. And uh, so 
be good to form raw masters already in the second generation. And so people like uh, carbon enhanced ideas. Thank you very much. Thank you for giving us such a very fun.